I'm joined now by Justin Jacobs. He's an associate professor of history at American University here in Washington. Um, this is something that you see celebrated in China. I, I took a Mandarin class. I was woefully inadequate at the language, never got a handle on it. But one of the things they brought up was this, these ethnic groups and how many there are in China. I mean, there's a huge number of them. Um, how difficult is it for them to kind of maintain this culture that Francis was talking about in her story and kind of also adapt to society as a whole, I guess? Well, it can be quite difficult, uh, but part of the reason why many of these ethnic identities persist for so long is that they are institutionalized by the state with certain incentives and benefits. If you are a non-Han minority group in China since 1949, there will be certain benefits like uh, family planning. Uh, you will be exempt from the one child policy for many years. You might have preferential treatment uh, quotas to get into university. Uh, 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 the entrance exams, it's very difficult to get into Chinese universities. And in the area of tourism, uh, now with the China's boom economy, there is money to be made by having a distinct ethnic identity that you might be able to market in the form of song and dance troops, ethnic villages or whatnot for uh, Han and foreign tourists who may come. So there are a lot of incentives in China to try to maintain um, a distinct non-Han minority identity. Is there a clash underway, though, uh, the past and the present? I mean, we, we don't really think of crossbows when we think of China. Like, when mm -hmm. I've been there, I think of smartphones. Everybody's on their phone, and they're, right. they're buying stuff with it and everything. I mean, is this kind of a, a battle, uh, you know, holding on to these cultural touchstones in a way when the encroachment of, of uh, the fast and furious society we live in is, is coming on? Yeah, it can be quite difficult. Uh, what you see in China today is these uh, you know, economic forces that are pulling people towards the Han ethnic core, uh, encouraging them to dress in ways that are similar to the Han, to speak the you know, standard Chinese Mandarin and whatnot. Um, and so it can be quite difficult to try to hold on to old traditions such as crossbows. China recognizes 58 uh, ethnic, uh, re you know, and, and some analysts say there's actually many more. Uh, kind of give me a sense of, of, of the landscape. Um, well, they recognize 55 non-Han minority groups, 56 with the Han. Um, and the story of how those ethnic groups came to be officially recognized is a fascinating one. It actually dates back to the founding of the PRC in the 1950s. They got the idea from the Soviet Union, who introduced what we might refer to as the world's first affirmative action policies, in which they encouraged the, the Chinese communists to recognize um, certain levels of autonomy and privileges that ethnic groups within China could have. Um, and in exchange, it was hoped that in exchange for this in, in, in increased respect for the minority groups of China, the appeal of separatist independence mo uh, movements would be diminished. Mm. Now, as part of this process, they wanted to show respect for the non-Han minority groups in China. And one way they did that is they asked them, uh, how about you self-identify, tell us who you are. We mm. won't necessarily tell you who you are, oh, like, like the old you know, oppressive regimes of the past had once done. Now, this was slightly naive, however, because what happened is they ended up getting more than 400 self-identified oh, groups <laughs> in China. And that's a problem, because each one of these groups will want to draw on state resources, those institutionalized incentives incentives and benefits. And the other problem is that each ethnic group was supposed to get a representative into the National People's Congress, which was supposed to have about 1,200 seats. Now, 400 of those are <laughs> occupied by uh, you know, um, minorities who are said to constitute less than 10% of the population. You have a problem. So how did they get specifically down to 56 ethnic groups? They actually said, well, this is unmanageable. An ideal number would be somewhere in the 50s. So they actually sent out Han ethnographers from Beijing to go out into the provinces and cull down the number of self-identified ethnic groups on so-called scientific criteria. The problem is that so-called scientific criteria can often be very su su subjective. We're going to have to leave it there, Boyd, but it was fascinating. We could talk about this for some time. Justin Jacobs, thanks so much for coming in. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And thanks for watching China 24. I'm Mike Wall.